Okay, so welcome to this afternoon's session. Um, we're going to be using the live polling app um, as much as possible, and I'd encourage everyone to participate as much as you can. So um, you can access this through the app. You can see up the top there if everyone just wants to log in with that. And we'd like to start the session with two live polling questions. So we'll have our first question up, please. Lovely. So, question to the audience. Uh, who currently has responsibility for the management of patients with BPS, that's bladder pain syndrome, in your department that you currently work? So, number one, general urologist. Number two, urologist with a special interest. Number three, pain specialist. Number four, general practitioner. Number five, gynaecologist. Or number six, a specialist multidisciplinary team. So, if you'd like to vote now. It's so, okay, you are still at Bouse. This isn't the X factor. <laughs> okay, so results? So mainly being managed by a general urologist. Okay. So can we move on to question two now, please? So question two, in your opinion, who do you think should have responsibility for the management of these patients with bladder pain syndrome? So that's number one, general urologist. Number two, urologist with a special interest. Number three, pain specialist. Four, general practitioner. Five, gynecologist. Or six, a specialist multidisciplinary team. So if you'd like to vote now. The urologist with special interest wins. Oh, sorry, multidisciplinary team. Okay, 38.3%. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, so our first speaker today is Suzanne Beer, who um, is a consultant at Addenbrooke's. She wrote the definitive article in the um, Journal of Urology on um, the guidelines on management of bladder pain. So Suzanne's going to update us on this now. Okay, so um, good afternoon. I've been asked to look at the guidance and uh, levels of evidence for bladder pain syndrome. So I'm going to be looking at the main um, publishing bodies, supporting publications, the management pathways that we're hopefully we're using, the individual treatments themselves, and the levels and grades of, of evidence um, associated with them. So as a gentle introduction to the afternoon, whilst definitions do vary between the different um, groups, um, there's a consensus that bladder pain syndrome is an unpleasant sensation, a pain, a pressure or a discomfort which is perceived to be related to the urinary bladder and is associated with lower urinary tract symptoms. And those symptoms tend to be urinary frequency, urgency and nocturia. And patients have a pain that is exacerbated by the bladder being filled and relieved when the bladder is emptied. It's felt by the Americans that these symptoms should be present for a minimum of six weeks, and um, the Europeans feel we should have a minimum of six months duration. But most importantly, it's in the absence of infection or any other causative or identifiable factor. It's important that we subtype these patients. So in fact, there are two types of patients, those that have a Hunter's ulcer, uh, a defect in the bladder mucosa, uh, which would be classified by the Europeans as a type 3C, and that occurs in very roughly 10% of patients. And the remainder will have no normal bladder mucosa, and they would be a type 1A, or a non-ulcer BPS patient. So as you can see, there are lots of bodies that you're familiar with, the European Association of Urology, American Urological Association, and they're probably the guidelines that we use most uh, closely in the UK, but there's also publications from Japan, from the Agency of Healthcare and Research Quality in America, the equivalent of our NICE, really. And uh, most recently, the Royal College of Obstetricians and Surgeons have proposed a new green top guidance um, in, um, in, with, with BSUG, which they propose should be the new gold standard for the UK for a gynaecologist at least. Um, there are multiple other bodies that contribute advice or recommendations, and the one I want to highlight is the one right at the top, which is the International Society for the Study of Bladder Pain Syndrome, 
um, previously called the European Society for the Study of Interstitial Cystitis, and it's kept the term ESSIC. The problem is you can see all these bodies that are publishing, and they're all publishing at different dates, so trying to get a consensus of evidence together is difficult because there are new studies coming out all the time. So I've been specifically looked, asked to look at level and strength of evidence because, after all, we're meant to uh, practice evidence-based for these patients, and yellow is going to represent the Europeans and green the Americans. I do have evidence from the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecology as well, as it, but as it's not yet been published and it just adds an extra level of complexity, I've, I've not used that today. So as a reminder, the European Association of Urology uses levels and strengths of evidence. So the levels that you're all very familiar with at the, the front of our guideline books are... Oh, can we get rid of that? <laughs> Um, level 1 is 1A is a meta-analysis of randomised control trials. Of note, it doesn't tell us how good a quality that randomised control trial is. It's just a meta-analysis of more than one randomised control trial. 1B is evidence from a single randomised control trial. 2A, a well-designed control study but without randomisation. 2B, evidence from one other study which is well-designed. 3, where it's a comparative correlation or case series. And 4 is expert opinion on its own. The EAU goes on to try and give a bit more quality to the studies that they've looked at. So when they give a strength of evidence, they talk about A, which is highly recommended. So it's a study of good quality. It's consistent and includes at least one randomized control trial. B is recommended still. It's well-conducted clinical study, but not randomized. And C is no clear recommendation as possible, and D is not recommended. The AUA loosely follows this as well. They give a, a, a high recommendation, a high strength of evidence for good quality randomized control trials and exceptional observational studies. B is moderate level or strength of evidence um, from a randomized control trial with some flaws or weaknesses or a good observational study. And low is where there is a study without randomization. They further add terminology um, such as expert opinion and clinical practice where there isn't an evidence base but it's a consensus of the urologists on the panel. So looking at evidence-based, we all know we should be taking a thorough history and examining our patients. There isn't an evidence base for that, but it's in all the recommendations. What is universally uh, recommended now and applied across the board, so a grey A recommendation, is we should be phenotyping our patients. So Nicol produced um, a paper really um, relating to chronic urological pain syndromes, whether that be bladder pain or chronic prostatitis or other types of pain. And uh, he uses the U-point system. So for us, looking at bladder pain syndrome, that's assessing the different aspects. So the urinary aspects for us, it's grade A recommended that we should be assessing patients thoroughly, doing a urine dipstick plus or minus culture, a flow rate, a post void residual, and they also recommend a cystoscopy. The Europeans like having cystoscopy for diagnostic classification reasons. The Americans are less keen on that unless there's a specific red flag or reason to do it. They ask us to fully assess our patients from a psychological viewpoint, organ specific, so most of our patients, we're talking about bladder, but they commonly will have vulva dinner or bowel problems, inflammation, neurological systems, and tenderness of muscles. So they expect you in your examinations to be palpating the perineum, the abdomen, the pelvis for tenderness. Another high recommendation that is universally applied is that this should be multimodal management. So we're not just starting one patient on one treatment, be it conservative, oral, or intracycle. We should be managing these patients with a combination, the one that suits them best. So you can understand that to try and apply guidelines and give a strength of evidence when more than one treatment is being used at once is quite challenging. And also, overall, everybody should have their pain managed and addressed immediately and at every stage of their treatment. So I'm going to later on compare the AUA and the EAU directly, but I just wanted to highlight again this very nice management algorithm which is um, published by the AUA, and it goes from first-line therapy to sixth-line therapy, and this is what I have in my head when I'm assessing my patient in clinic. And we can apply the EAU recommendations within this, um, this uh, a plan really. So first line treatments are conservative. Second line treatments are when we introduce oral and intravesical therapies and you'll be interested to see that the highest level or uh, strength sorry, of evidence that the AUA gives is for actually 
physical therapy. So for myofascial trigger release and for relaxation and lengthening of muscles. And that gets an a, a grade A um, recommendation. Whereas other treatments that we commonly use are given um, Bs or C recommendations. There's less good evidence in the eyes of the AUA for that. Our third line treatments are more invasive with hydrodistension and fulguration or resection of Hunter's ulcers. Fourth line treatments, Botox is coming up in the world as more and more trials are being published in the area of pain. Neuromodulation, particularly sacral nerve stimulation, is favoured by the AUA. The use of cyclosporin comes down pretty low. It's got reasonable evidence um, against uh, in randomized control trials. However, because of the risk of adverse effects, the AUA down classify this and put this low on the treatment regime, which is appropriate. And then finally, it's universally accepted. If somebody has an end-stage bladder with intractable bladder pain uh, syndrome and symptoms that cannot be treated and all other treatments have failed, then it's appropriate to form perform some kind of urinary diversion with or without cystectomy. The EUA um, gives an overview um, slightly differently, and there's this algorithm that they've used, which I think is helpful. Um, cystoscopy should happen early, so you can perform your diagnosis, and you can classify patients. Um, if there's a Hunter's ulcer, treat it. There's evidence that about up to 90% of patients can get immediate symptom relief, and that can be sustains. So at two or three years, about half of them need retreatment, but half of them still have some symptom improvement. And if there's no Hunter's ulcer, or they fail to get adequate pain relief, we go down the other part of the pathway, using complementary therapies, modifying diet, TENS machines, oral tablets. If they fail going, fail going on to intravercycle therapies, and then on to specialist pain teams and um, the chronic pain team. So it's quite helpful in this algorithm to know when we should be referring on. So looking more specifically at the different treatment types, I'm going to start with first-line therapy. And we'd all agree that we would counsel our patients about dietary modification, avoiding acidic foods, avoiding caffeine, things that can trigger their pain. They should manage their stress. They should seek out um, uh, regular exercise. There's benefits that that can help. And um, there is some limited evidence and data that there's benefit from acupuncture. It can do no harm apart from to their pockets. And um, pain management should again be discussed and addressed. So our second line therapies are probably where we start to come in more actively as urologists. And out of all the drugs we have, you can see that the EAU and AUA do not reach a consensus on their strength of evidence. But there is good results from amitriptyline. There are randomized control trials looking at patients up to about 300, titrating up amitriptyline from 10 milligrams to 100 milligrams. And there's significant pain and symptom improvement with amitriptyline compared to placebo, although the most benef benefit is seen at about 50 milligrams daily of amitriptyline, which comes with significant risk of side effect. Um, unfortunately for us, I, well, I can't get pentasan polysulfate, also known as Elmeron. It's not licensed in the UK. The NICE have um, published advice on it, and it's quite controversial in some ways. The highest um, level of evidence, so the meta-analysis of three randomized control trials. In fact, there have been about seven randomized control trials, four against placebo. And the, there's controversy. In many studies, there's been good benefit. In a recent randomized control trial against placebo, there was no benefit. So the AUA strongly recommend it. Um, sorry, the EAU strongly recommend it. The um, AUA are more reserved. If it doesn't work, then you can add an intravesical heparin. That seems to help. So that multimodal approach seems to be of benefit. And there is limited um, small trials on cimetidine and hydroxyzine. And I think ultimately the jury is out. But they're still kept in our management um, algorithms and regimes as they can be useful for certain patients, particularly in combination therapy. The problem with intravesical treatments is that there's no consensus on what is the best dose to give patients, how many times a week they should have it, what duration of treatment they should have. So trying to compile these studies and getting meaningful information is difficult. The best information really comes from um, lignocaine and bicarbonate. So that's 8.4% um, sodium bicarbonate added to lignocaine instilled in the bladder. But again, studies are, are poorly numbered. They've not got long follow-up. But they do, work, they do seem to um, have better symptom control compared to placebo. The next best studies that really come up with um, success against placebo are DMSO. Again, not on license in the UK for widespread use. Um, 
and pentasan polysulfate intravocicly, particularly in combination with oral pentasan polysulfate, neither of which we can easily get. Um, equally, things that we would be more familiar with, such as cystostat, which is hyaluronic acid, and chondroitin, they have reasonable effects, and in combination, they actually work more successfully. But they're given lower um, grades, of, um, uh, grades of evidence. Going on to our third line treatment, so we would tend to reserve hydro distension um, for very few people. Whilst it can give about 60% benefit in patients, the results very rarely last greater than six months. An ulcer fulguration, we've already discussed, is beneficial if you see an ulcer. Make sure when you're consenting your patient for cystoscopy that you also consent them for treatment, resection, or fulguration of that Hunter's ulcer. Going on to botulinum toxin, in my hospital we can use it for overactive bladders, for neuropathic bladders, but we can't use it for bladder pain. Um, there have been um, seven prospective trials, three randomized control trials of using Botox against and placebo, and they have been shown to be beneficial in improving symptom in most studies. Um, of note, you should really include the trigone, and of note, it's not a great um, treatment for patients that have got ulcer-type um, bladder pain syndrome. If you add in hydrodistension, you can get better benefit. We should be using 100 international units of Botox because it has the same outcome as 200 and it avoids the increased risk of retention. And hydro distending roughly every six months. If you do that, you can get sustained benefit at two years. There are no randomized controlled trials for neuromodulation or PTNS, but the studies that have been performed have shown benefits. And so they are recommended by the EAU, at least. And then fifth line, cyclosporine comes into everything. There have been two randomized control trials, uh, one against um, pentasan polysulfate, and it does better than pentasan polysulfate, but it comes with significant adverse effects. So it's not there universally for everybody, and it comes low down on our treatment algorithm. And then finally, as discussed before, urinary diversion with or without cystectomy for those intractable end-stage bladders, counselling the patient carefully that surgery may or may not improve their pain and their problems. It diverts the urine, but they still may have pain. So we are practising, we're trying to practise an evidence base. We've got heterogeneity of the studies. We've got contro controversy um, between the um, different guidelines. People don't agree on the strengths and levels of evidence. But we have to have some kind of management algorithm because this is a difficult patient population, a difficult group to treat. Um, this study um, has taken something called a grading system, and they looked at randomized control trials and systematic reviews specifically looking at the evidence uh, for treatments for BPA and BPS. So they took 19 studies, and they, picked, they nitpicked very, very carefully and look very, very carefully at the study design, the nut, how well-powered it was, what the dropout rates were, was there bias, was it consistent? And they tried to really um, decide on the quality of these studies. And overall, they gave each aspect or each domain a grade from one to four, and they added everything up. They feel that the guidelines that we're using, based on the evidence from the studies, is um, overestimating both the quality and the strength of evidence for all of these treatments. So it's further weakening our foundations for treatment for bladder pain syndrome. So in summary, um, the European and American guidelines are, are used in UK practice, and I think they're very sound and safe. There are randomized control trials and other good quality studies that do give us evidence for many of the treatments we're actively using. However, there are different levels and grades of evidence applied across the guidelines. It's sometimes unclear the quality of the studies that we're basing these guideline recommendations on. There's a strong influence from clinicians and consensus in many of the guidelines. Um, often these treatments are looked at in isolation, and there are multiple treatments that we could be using all at once. We don't have the evidence or the, gui the guidance on, on that exactly. And it's not clear from these guidelines who should be treating patients. The gynaecology guidelines, the green top set, should be gynaecologists, maybe GPs. We don't have a UK guideline for urologists yet. NICE do not produce one. So that's a question that we've already addressed this morning, and I think one that will be taken forward in the future as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Um, so I just remind everybody that at any time you can submit a question um, to the panel through the BAUS app, if you just go back to the home page.
Um, but we'd like to move on to our third live polling question now, which is, considering the treatment of patients with bladder pain syndrome, would you be happy as the urologist to initiate treatment with gabapentin? Yes or no? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, the background to this session was that uh, during discussions at the FNU committee meeting about um, sessions for BAUS, um, our erstwhile leader suggested that um, bladder pain should not be managed by urologists, but that we should exclude any organic cause and send them all back to the GPs. I stupidly said I thought that was completely unreasonable and therefore got landed with chairing the session. So that's the background and what we're trying to, to achieve today. So um, the next talk is by Mary Garthwaite, who works at Middlesbrough. Um, she's a rising star on the FNU scene, so we'll be looking forward to hearing her views. OK. Um, I will say there is personal opinion in this, and the committee was divided in their opinion. So um, I am going to try and be quite unbiased in stating what we do now as urologists all over the country, but I think by the fact that there are a lot of people in the audience for what is usually perceived as quite a niche interest probably indicates that we're doing an awful lot of different things and no one really is sure whether what they're doing is right or wrong. Let's see if we can get this to move on. Nope. Could someone help me with moving the first slide along, please? Right, super. So I think to start off by saying where we are now, we should look at the problems that we all face, really. And um, I think one of the biggest things that I see in practice is that patients are often ignored for quite a period of time and then eventually get on a path to, to secondary care, but do it in very different circuitous routes. Um, they often start with their GP, but may get referred to gynaecology. They might go to urology. Uh, they might actually end up in colorectal if they've got sort of bowel symptoms related to it. Some of them occasionally get directly into a pain team, but that very much depends on service provision locally. And then they seem to get into a cycle of bouncing between the GP and secondary care specialists. There's no one really knows what to do, and it's like sort of passing on a hot potato. You don't really want to keep hold of it for too long. If you add into that mix that there's poor recognition of the diagnosis, even amongst urologists in general, and over 10 years ago now, I was involved in a publication where we sent out a questionnaire to gynaecologists and urologists looking at um, their knowledge of the diagnostic criteria, um, and it was pretty poor. Urologists were better than gynaecologists, so I have to say it's quite interesting that gynaecologists now seem to want to say that we should send everyone to them, um, let alone the fact that a small but significant number of these patients will be men. Um, there is still very limited understanding of the disease. The Americans are much uh, further forward than us in, in terms of research, Trying to get funding for research into this type of condition is very, very difficult. Um, it is quite well accepted now that bladder pain syndrome, which is the current name for this condition, is an umbrella term um, with very many different clinical subgroups. So there's not just the Hunter's ulcers and the non Hunter's ulcers, which is very much a diagnostic uh, criteria and was uh, part of the diagnostic criteria used in research for this subject a long time ago. But in terms of the clinical situation, the U-point criteria allow you to differentiate the groups uh, of patients you'll see into ones with predominant symptoms in different domains. And there's also a massive overlap with other um, organs. So there's a lot of patients who will have chronic pelvic pain syndrome of bladder origin, but there'll also be those which come with gynecological origin or prostatic origin. In terms of what we then see the patients are going through is they're going round in this circle between different specialties and primary care, and they're getting an awful lot of conflicting advice and opinions and collecting those along the way and are left to try and make sense of it. 
So the end result when they end up with a clinician who has a specialist interest in this area is that you, you have your first consultation with an extremely frustrated, often very angry patient. Um, and those, those patients are therefore perceived as a very difficult group. And it's a challenge for both the clinician and the patient. And I would argue, put from a personal perspective, that what we all sort of talk of as, oh, those difficult patients, actually is a way of us saying, well, clinically, we, we have inadequate knowledge and inadequate tools to deal with this. So I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about the varied approaches that you, you'll see within units in the country. And you can do the same thing. You can, you can go to one extreme to another. And I would suspect that most people's practice lies somewhere in between. But approach one would be to just merely rule out a functional or an anatomical problem with the urinary tract, i.e. something you might be able to do something about easily. And if you don't find that, discharge them. It's not a urological problem. And approach two would be a much more holistic, multidisciplinary approach where you're aiming to support the patient in front of you as best you can, manage their expectations, educate them, and endeavor to the best of your ability to help alleviate their symptoms, in particular as a urologist, their bladder symptoms. So if we look at approach one, and as Suzanne mentioned, it, we, we do follow the EAU guidelines quite a lot. Most of these patients will be sent off from their first consultation with a plan for a cystoscopy and an ultrasound scan. Now, I would make a plea that if you really think the patient in front of you has bladder pain syndrome, that you don't send them for a local anaesthetic flexible cystoscopy. If you've got a patient who's just told you that their life is ruled by horrific pain on filling of the bladder, then really you're doing nothing but subjecting them to torture if you expect them to cope with a local anaesthetic flexible cystoscopy. If you are going to put these patients through invasive tests, then really the onus is on us to make sure we get the most out of that test because you don't want to have to keep going back. So if you do a cystoscopy under GA, it allows you to document their bladder capacity at that time in their, their disease pathway, look for those mucosal changes and potentially treat them in that sitting. You could even do a hydrodistension at that time if you wished, as well as dealing with the ulcers. It will allow you to rule out other urethral and bladder pathology. And I've put a question at the bottom because I know that there are some people who will always biopsy these bladders, even if they look perfectly normal and have a normal capacity and don't bleed on refill. And I'm not really convinced anymore that biopsy is essential because most of the biopsies you take will come back saying chronic inflammatory changes. Occasionally, if you ask specifically, are there mast cells in there, then you will get a pathologist to comment on that. But that doesn't really alter your management at all. I would say if you think that you're seeing odd red patches or whatever and you want to rule out CIS as a cause or whatever, then obviously you should be taking biopsy. And then, as I mentioned, they often get an ultrasound scan and it's really, well, what are we doing this? What are we looking for in this group of patients? We're obviously, with this approach, wanting to rule out a functional or an anatomical abnormality that we might be able to do something with. But their upper tract is really not going to be responsible for any symptoms related to bladder pain syndrome. You could argue you're doing it for an accurate post-void residual volume, but really, as we all know, that, that's very inaccurate on one sitting. Certainly, if they have dipstick hematuria, which in my experience, a lot of these patients do because the underlying problem in the bladder is an inflammatory process, then you are going to potentially want to rule out upper tract pathology. I have, in my experience, come across a number of patients that get booked directly for urodynamics. And two questions really is really and why? Because if you have a patient in front of you who you think that there is a real indication for urodynamics to help you unpick uh, their clinical uh, picture and symptoms, then has that patient really got bladder pain syndrome? Because urodynamics is not a routine test for this. And I have unfortunately cancelled a number of patients who have been directly sent to me for urodynamics and spent the time instead having a consultation with a tearful patient who unburdens a 10-year history of, of bladder pain syndrome symptoms. <laughs> 
But you do all that, you rule out a problem that you can do anything easy with, you give the patient and their GP advice on diet and conservative management and maybe the initial start of the analgesic pathway uh, and suggest onward referral to the chronic pain team if needs be. And they often then get discharged from urology at that point or from gynaecology or from wherever. So approach two, and I'm sure you can probably tell which approach I tend to favour, but is, is basically to take ownership of the problem and this is a bladder problem. We may not understand it fully, but the end organ involved here is the bladder or the urethra. It's the lower urinary tract. It is a chronic pain syndrome of visceral origin. And because nociception is at the level of the bladder, that is the end organ involved. Yes, they then get hyperexcitability of the bladder afferents and you get organ, organ crosstalk, so you end up with pain outside the region of the bladder um, and that's well recognized and well documented in the literature and there's a lot of ongoing research into the pain pathways within the lower urinary tract and the crosstalk that happens with the bowel with the gynecological organs so it's no different from other chronic pain syndromes in that it does have a neuropathic element to it that's developed because it's a chronic abnormality a chronic um, abnormality of the pain pathways but it started as a nociceptive pain syndrome, and quite often there is still a nociceptive element to it. The patient still feels significant pain in the bladder on filling or in the urethra as the bladder fills. Many years ago, we, when the initial um, research was being done on this, Turner Warwick uh, and his group did find an increased density of pain fibres in the mucosa of... of bladders um, with uh, a bladder pain syndrome and that was the sort of first start of the, the research that's looking at the pain pathway so I really don't think we can um, shirk the idea that this isn't a urological problem. Path of approach two is about being honest. I spend quite a lot of time sounding like a cracked record telling patients that I don't fully understand the disorder. I can probably never tell them what triggered it in them. I don't have a magic solution, but here's what we can try and do. Early multidisciplinary team input is essential, and I know on the EAU guidelines, it talks about sending to chronic pain management as one of the, the later strategies, but I would actually say it's very useful if you do have a friendly um, colleague in the chronic pain service who has an interest in chronic pelvic pain syndrome, so that you get them involved sooner rather than later. Because sooner, in terms of my patients, is obviously very late in their pathway. You would still rule out other functional or anatomical problems of the urinary tract. You still want to rule out uh, intracycle pathology, CIS, other things that can cause um, frequency, uh, pain. So they do usually still get an ultrasound scan, particularly, as I mentioned, they often have dipstick hematuria. You still give them the basic dietary and general advice, and you then think about a treatment strategy based on their predominant symptoms. So if, they, if their organ-specific symptoms are predominant, then you do think about the targeted oral or intravesical therapies. If pain is the predominant, then that's where you do start to go up the analgesic ladder with gabapentin, pregabalin, the sort of um, more in-depth um, analge neuropathic analgesics. And that pain management pathway mirrors that for all other pain syndromes of visceral origin. And certainly don't be frightened of talking about using simple analgesics during flare-ups and even the basic neuropathic analgesics such as gabapentin, pregabalin and amitriptyline. Other devices such as TENS can be useful. You've heard acupuncture mentioned as well. Unfortunately, in Middlesbrough, we don't have any um, ability to get acupuncture on the NHS, but it is a postcode lottery in this country, and I know other people do have pain teams that, that will provide that. I'm lucky in Middlesbrough. I work with a gentleman called John Hughes, who's an international renowned expert on chronic pelvic pain syndrome, so he and I work very closely together. And we often with the, mo the more tricky end-stage patients do consultations together. <laughs>
Physiotherapy is invaluable, and I'm again lucky enough to have a physiotherapist who is a, a pelvic floor, floor physiotherapist who specialises in pan-pelvic dysfunction both, and deals with both men and women. Um, we know that um, dealing with pelvic trigger points, getting a patient doing low impact exercise, getting them to learn to relax their pelvic floor and pelvic girdle muscles can help. Psychology input is also hit and miss in the country. I currently don't have any good access to it, but that hopefully is changing in the, in the near future. But if you do have access to it, which is often via the pain team, it can be invaluable. But you've got to have a patient who wants to engage in that process. In terms of the targeted bladder therapies, and I, I won't dwell on this because Suzanne's covered it really well with the evidence base, you have an, a number of options. In my practice, they tend to start on oral therapies. If they fail those, they then the, the, the first line ones, you then think about um, oral uh, pentasam polysulfate, which I can prescribe on an unlicensed but named um, basis. Intravascular gag therapy can be very useful, but it's none of these work for everyone. It's a case of trying it and see, and trying not to run through it too quickly, but also try not to prevaricate and, and delay too much. Hydrodistension, we've he heard mentioned, and also diathermial resection of ulcers, ulcers can be extremely beneficial for a small group of patients. If you have a patient with a, mainly a urethral pain syndrome and they do get stenosis, then urethral dilatation can actually keep those patients ticking over for several years. I've put Botox there. I don't have access to Botox the same as Suzanne does for, for pain uh, reasons, so we, don't, we can't offer that. You then keep the patient on follow-up. I don't see them that often, but they have access to come back to clinic once a year if needs be. They're often off with a, with a specialist nurse having intravascular therapies or they're having their, their pain uh, team appointment. They might also be going to the um, specialist urogyne clinic for chronic gynecological pelvic pain. They might come to me and only have a five-minute appointment once a year, but that keeps them ticking over and it gives them the confidence to know that if they do have a problem, they have a quick way back in. But there are those patients where the bladder really isn't fit for purpose anymore, and it's doing that patient no favours. And it's in that small group you do have to be brave enough to say, actually, this bladder needs writing off, and the patient is not going to get anywhere further if you don't consider simple cystectomy and urinary diversion or urinary diversion with leaving uh, the bladder in situ. And I'm sure most of us who have performed that can name and think of patients who said to you in hindsight they wish they'd had that done years ago. I certainly don't advocate rushing people through to, to, to urinary diversion and cystectomy. Um, it needs a lot of counselling and a lot of support and you have to be very very clear to them that it may not improve their pain and in the worst case scenario they will go through it all and they will still have the same level of pain however they will not have the frequency or the urgency that they had or the horrific pain of urine actually having to accumulate in the bladder and pass so just to finish my personal view um, and I know I'm arguing from one standpoint, and they, they, you can debate this ad infinitum, but the patient in front of you is not the problem. It is their bladder and then their subsequent pain syndrome that is the problem. And I don't think we got anywhere in modern medicine, and certainly not in modern neurology, by just saying, I don't understand a disease, therefore I'm not going to bother. Someone else can deal with it. I think that the biggest bit of wisdom that I was ever given and could pass on is to share the problem. So a multidisciplinary approach really does help. And if you can establish that, those networks, however informally, it can really help. So share the problem, but don't shirk it. OK. You've got a question there. Thank you very much, Mary, for that excellent overview of the management of these patients in, in current clinical practice. So we've got another voting question for the audience. Um, 
We'd like to know, are you involved in a formal MDT meeting at which you can present and discuss these patients with bladder pain syndrome? Sort of a, as you'd expect, really. Um, finally, our, our last talk is um, by Sachin Muldi, who's uh, just been appointed to Guy's Hospital as an FNU consultant. Um, unfortunately for him, he's currently working at UCLH um, for Ms. Greenwell, and therefore she managed to um, delegate her talk to him. So Sachin's going to tell us what, what he thinks the answer is to future management. These Great. Thank you very much. So, we've all been in this situation, you're at the end of a long clinic, it's 4.30, it's been a long day, you're tired, you want to go home, you've got one last set of notes, you think, great, there's light at the end of the tunnel. You pick up your notes, this is the referral letter. You have a 22-year-old lady who's had 10 years of bladder pain, her life's in complete tatters, she has severe depression, emotional, mental health issues, she's had cystoscopies, hydrodistensions, tried oral therapies, tried intracycle therapies, she's seen gynecologists and colorectal teams, she saw someone privately had Botox, she's tried numerous things without any benefit, and she's here to see you uh, to solve her severe bladder pain. And this is how we all feel, I'm sure, at this situation. But what about the patient, as we've already heard? For them, they're being passed around, as Mary said already, between primary and secondary care, between a number of dif different specialists. They try numerous different treatments, go through so many investigations, and don't really find like they're getting any answers to, to, their, to their problems. And I think it's our role as, as urologists uh, really to help these patients, but also to try and help them in the best way possible. As we already mentioned, phenotyping is extremely important. We're talking about different diseases. This is a heterogeneous group of patients. We know there's a difference between the classic and the non-ulcer disease. Uh, cystoscopically, we know that the, the classic patients with classic IC will have ulcerations, will have glomerulations, small capacity bladders, whereas those with non-ulcer disease will have a normal bladder under anesthesia. We know histologically there are differences. Patients with non-ulcer disease typically will have no significant abnormality, whereas those with classic IC will have high levels of mast cells or trans-epithelial migration of mast cells, sub-epithelial deposits of mononuclear cells. So there are differences histologically. And in response to treatments, again, we don't have a, a good evidence base for a lot of the treatments, but for some of the studies that do subtype patients, there is some evidence that amitriptyline, for example, works better for the non-ulcer patients. The intravesical treatments may work better for those with, with classic IC. Uh, we know that laser to ulcers, obviously, or major reconstructive surgery is only going to benefit those patients who have evidence of end organ bladder disease. But importantly, the patients with this, these classic IC features are a minority. The vast majority, 90% or so, do not have any, of, any evidence of bladder dysfunction or disease. So our role should be to exclude other pathology and more serious underlying pathology, of course, to identify these patients that may benefit from bladder-specific targeted therapies, but then to help these patients the most, we should identify those that do not have end-organ bladder disease and refer them to someone who can look after all aspects of their disease. So there is a thinking now more and more recently that bladder pain syndrome in a large majority of patients is, is not a bladder-specific disease, that the pathophysiology likely does relate to pain mechanisms and to hyperesthesia and allodynia. There are systemic alterations in pain modulation. And these definitions would sort of highlight that. The, the, they all present with a common symptom, although the actual underlying etiology is not known. Um, and in the vast majority, we don't find any, any evidence of bladder-specific disease. More and more people are talking about this as a functional somatic syndrome. The majority of patients with chronic pelvic pain syndrome describe pain in the bladder, but also from other areas, not necessarily all within the pelvis either. We know that a lot of these patients share features that patients with other functional somatic syndromes have. So patients will often come with bladder pain in addition to IBS or 
chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, a number of other conditions, and all may also have significant psychological uh, disturbances as well. And all of this needs to be taken into account in managing this patient's condition. They, they're all, they all play a factor. The British Pain Society recognises this. They produce their guidelines uh, with a number of practice points um, which they think would offer the best integrated care for these patients. And number one, of course, is for us to exclude any serious underlying disease, same as for gynaecologists or, or for colorectal, uh, to identify those who have red flags and need uh, further investigation. Uh, but then when one's chronic pelvic pain is diagnosed, to recognize that this is a multi-system disorder. They will have other functional disorders. They will have some psychosocial um, elements such as anxiety or depression that needs to be addressed. They'll have behavior and sexual aspects to their, to their illnesses. With this, with this kind of population, there's a large amount of information that needs to be given to these patients. And we need someone to, to really give a lot of support to these patients. As mentioned earlier, early assessment and management by physiotherapists is also highlighted as, as a key feature to improve uh, the pain for these patients. So what does an ideal model of care look like? We've heard about the different approaches that we could have. Um, and in America, this is the Beaumont Clinic from Michigan. And Kenneth Peters is one of the world um, leaders in bladder pain syndrome. He's uh, one of the leading researchers in this area. And in 2010, he set up this clinic in Michigan. Based on the idea and the principle that I've just discussed, that the majority of patients with bladder pain don't actually have a bladder-specific disease, but have a much more multi-system disease. And so his, his vision was to create a center where patients could go and see a range of people to have all aspects of their condition treated at the same time. It's just short overview, a short clip of, of their clinic. Uh, there's no volume. It's not going to be good with that volume. Staff takes the time to really listen to the patient, working with each woman to tailor a plan to manage her specific symptoms. The center's integrative approach to medical care includes a variety of treatment options, acupuncture, medical massage, Reiki, pain clinics, and innovative drug therapies. The center is at the forefront of research and clinical trials, giving patients the most advanced care possible. So this clinic does a number of things very, very well. First of all, and most importantly, they have a central person coordinating the care for these women. So there's a, there's a nurse practitioner who will spend an hour with these patients, with a urologist, going through a full, complete, comprehensive history a range of questionnaires for research purposes, a full physical examination. The urologist will then see the patient and um, perform cystoscopy and other investigations such as urinalysis uh, as appropriate to identify those patients who have any other underlying disease. The women's health nurse practitioner will coordinate this patient's care, um, determining whether they need to see a gynecologist, whether they have any gynecological symptoms or, or GI symptoms. They will then coordinate the care between a various, a various range of other specialists as well, including pain, physio, pain psychologists, and alternative therapies. The role of the nurse practitioner, I think, is essential. The fact that you can spend 60 minutes or more with a patient in itself is probably therapeutic. We don't have time in our clinics to, to spend that amount of time with a patient to give them that volume of information that they need. They provide a point of contact, a point of support, so the patient knows if they ever have any flares, if they have any problems, they have a named person they can get hold of. They go through a range of questions in their history, including abuse, sexual dysfunction, bowel dysfunction, psychological aspects. They talk about the whole range, as we mentioned earlier, of self-help therapies, education. And they also perform treatments, so bladder installations, tibial nerve stimulation, sacral neuromodulation programming. The role of the urologist, of course, they have specialist, urologists with specialist interests um, who do the urological workup, exclude any significant underlying disease, perform cystoscopy to assess whether they have true bladder disease, uh, and perform, as necessary, various treatments uh, depending on, on the type of patient they have. Gynecologists are there specifically to assess for sexual dysfunction, vulvodynia, um, hormone replacement therapy. 
and same for GI surgeons to assess constipation, faecal incontinence, and the range of other conditions like IBS, for example, that, that patients often present with. One of the most important aspects of this clinic, again, as we heard earlier, is physiotherapy and early access to physiotherapy. We know that, that proper pelvic floor function is essential for normal bowel, sexual, and urinary uh, function. And pelvic floor dysfunction is, is commonly overlooked, but the majority of patients with chronic pelvic pain do have pelvic floor dysfunction, myofascial trigger points. And so we know, and there's evidence, that pelvic floor physiotherapy with intravaginal myofascial release can improve the pain for a significant proportion of patients. They perform other treatments, mainly in research, mainly in research settings, but again, in a setup like this, you can do that kind of good quality research, looking at transvaginal trigger point injections, pelvic floor Botox injections, intravaginal diazepam. The pelvic pain psychologist, again, a very important person. We know that these patients have lots of psychological aspects to their condition and that needs to be managed and dealt with specifically by a specialist. Again, there are pain specialists doing local nerve blocks as and when required if patients have very specific distributions to their pain. And finally, they do have a big integrative medicine uh, setup. And when I started looking at this, I thought, well, this is ridiculous. Um, but actually, there is good evidence for this. There, there's, there are randomized controlled trials looking at guided imagery, for example, randomizing people to listening to a 25 minute CD uh, or someone else listening to nothing, and there's significant improvements in their pain scores. They offer therapies for stress relief, massage, Reiki therapy, because we know that pelvic pain has a strong psychological component. And this is all very important in, uh, in truly providing a holistic approach to their care. They have nutritional uh, assessments by trained dietitians, to avoid any trigger factors. Uh, and I think the time that these patients can spend in clinics, uh, seeing a range of specialists like this, uh, really does uh, assess all of their needs. So I think there are different ways to manage these patients. And of course, everyone will do things differently and, and there's no consensus at the moment. But we could either carry on doing what we're doing now, which is seeing patients in busy clinics where we don't have the time that these patients deserve, where we can't focus on all aspects of their condition, uh, or we can work in a truly multidisciplinary service. We can identify those who have true bladder disease um, or who will benefit from bladder-directed therapies, uh, and the rest could be managed by a range of professionals who can assess the psychological, behavioral components of the patient's condition, the gynecological, colorectal aspects, and this can all be done in one central place without the patient having to uh, be passed around and around uh, for years with no answer to their symptoms. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that vision of the management of these patients for the future. We've had lots of questions in. Um, so just before we close the session, we'd like to move on to a couple of those um, questions. Obviously, if anyone's got any others, if you'd like to make your way over to the microphone. So. Um, the question's been asked in a number of different ways, but basically is around how we are sure that it's the same syndrome that we're discussing. Mary. Well, the short answer is we're not. There isn't one bladder pain syndrome. And um, I disagree with the idea of there, there being no true bladder disease. I think our tests at the moment don't look for the right thing. We've We've known for a long time, um, and I've published on it previously, that the urothelium in these patients is abnormal. It doesn't uh, produce functioning mm -hmm. tight junctions. It has a different cytokeratin profile. Um, it doesn't provide a barrier. Um, we know from the other basic science studies that uh, in some patient subgroups, you will find that it is mainly a, a problem with the sensory pathway, and there's a lot of work being done on the purinergic uh, nerve pathways. Um, at the moment and so it isn't one it is an umbrella term and we have to do the best we can to clinically subdivide it into groups to try and help target our management um, I have to say it would be lovely if money were no option in the NHS to have have a type of uh, setup where I could offer in Middlesbrough uh, Reiki and acupuncture with mood lighting and uh, whales singing in the background or whatever. But I think you just have to try and, and do your best to clinically work out 
where your patient sits. And there's a huge overlap with gynaecology as well. So I do share quite a lot of patients with gynaecologists, and there might be patients who have endometriosis in the background as well, and their primary problem is not necessarily the bladder, but they have developed a coexisting bladder pain syndrome. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, so I see that Tamsin is at one of the microphones. Oh, no, someone ahead of her. Sorry, I do apologize. I can't see who you are. Hi, I'm Srijit Banerjee. Um, just a quick question. Would your algorithm in terms of treatment change whether the patient is a man or a woman, although primarily all our patients most likely would be women, but would that change your algorithm based on whether it's a... 25-year-old man or a 25-year-old um, woman? No, no, it's thought that the ratio of uh, men to women is about 10 to 1, although there's some dispute about that now. So there'll be about 30 to 60 men per 100,000 that are affected by this. And the algorithm doesn't really change. Um, it, it's an individual approach, so it's not just one uh, treatment fits all. Um, so it, it would be treating them. So there is, there are overlaps. So we're alluding to the fact that um, we're talking about bladder pain syndrome specifically. You can get, if you've got more than one organ affected, it becomes chronic pelvic pain syndrome. And with men, there's, a, there's an overlap often that we see clinically. And again, there's controversy whether bladder pain syndrome in men is just an extension of a form of chronic prostatitis. Um, but I would treat them the same. So I would phenotype them, I'd subtype them, and I would treat them individually and go through my treatment protocols as before and see what works for them. Sure, thank you. Okay. Thank you. A, a, a popular question that's, that's come in on the iPad here is, why is cystodistension third line? Why don't you want to scope them at the start to rule out CIS, etc.? Well, I, do, um, I don't see it as third line. Um, that is the EAU guideline. But it, as I mentioned in my presentation, if you're going to put them through a cystoscopy, then really the onus is on you to do as much as you possibly can for that patient at that point. So it's not necessarily just a diagnostic cystoscopy, it can be a therapeutic cystoscopy at that time, combining it with a hydrodistension if you felt the bladder capacity was reduced, um, or you know, even with fulguration of Hunter's ulcers if you find them. So the reason it comes third line is because the strength of evidence and the, um, the publications are quite poor, low numbers, it's not randomised, um, and hence that's where it comes further down. But um, there are some patients you shouldn't hydrodistend if they've got bad ulcer disease. That's, that's not a thing to do. And uh, somebody was also asking about the type of hydrodistension. So there's no gold, gold standard to the, the way you should hydrodistend a bladder. Um, but there's a general consensus that people may agree or disagree with that we should be um, inspecting the bladder, um, filling the bladder to the capacity. Um, the height of the water should be around about 80 centimetres of water above the patient, and that should be held for one to two minutes. Then you release the fluid and you reinspect for glomerulations. Um, but there's no gold standard um, to how the bladder hydrodistension should be performed. Okay, Tamsin. Um, thank you very much. Excellent session. Um, I'm sure Sachin's looking forward to all your referrals of bladder pain syndrome patients, which is why he's giving Thanks, the talk and not me. <laughs> Secondly, I'd like to say that there is a service in the UK, in the NHS, that is resourced with um, alternative medicines, physiotherapists, CBT and psychology, and that's the pain service. And therefore, we would be best excluding pathology and sending our patients who have in 75% of cases got a generalized somatoform pain syndrome to see the pain specialist where they can be appropriately and holistically managed. Thank you. I have to say, Tamsin, actually our chronic pain service in Middlesbrough doesn't have the ability to provide all that for their patients, much to their annoyance. But I think you'll find that um, a lot of local pain services can't provide all those holistic therapies and it has to come out of the pocket of the patient. Okay, sorry. I've got one question over there. Uh, Jonathan. Yeah, hi, Jonathan Goddard from Leicester. Mary, thank you very much. Excellent talk. A couple of things, really. I completely agree your sentiments with GA cystoscopy. However, I carry out a, a sort of Curtis Nichols style challenge test. So obviously, I have to have a patient awake so I can discuss it. Now, I know exactly what you mean and the look of horror on their faces when I tell them they're having another cystoscopy. But I do them all myself, and it's part of my diagnosis and, and treatment. That was one thing. The, the, the second thing really was the, um, 
uh, Eurodynamics, that's about taking the wrong history, isn't it? Yes. And then the last thing, I'm sorry to take three things, it's a bit rude of me. But the last thing is, is Hunter's ulcers. I think people underestimate those. Where people, they have a cystoscopy, they see a red patch, they go, oh my word, I'm afraid this could be cancer. They take a biopsy and then they come back to the clinic and say, thank goodness it's not cancer discharged, but then they haven't had their Hunter's <laughs> ulcer treated. And, and I think that is actually a problem that people are not recognising. You know, I, th I think, um, well, I agree with certainly points two and three completely, <laughs> Jonathan. Your point one, I think if you're doing that as a, a specialist with an interest and you are doing the flexible cystoscopy yourself with a particular indication in mind, fine. Yeah. But these are, this, that's not what usually happens. It's no usually quite. in clinic where someone's thinking, oh, God, what am I going to do with this patient? I know, I'll send them for an ultrasound. And I'll, I'll send them to the general pool for the flexible cystoscopy list. Yes, I can. Thank you very much. So, well, one last question. I'm Sanjeev Agrawal from um, London, and um, I've got a special interest in this um, condition for the last 20 years. I was trained in Detroit, where we was participating in the NIH studies. That's where this um, interest started. Um, uh, first, uh, first of all, I would really congratulate Mary because the presentation that you made was very, very succinct and clear. I'm so glad that it just absolutely mirrors my practice and saying to the patients that uh, the difficult patients is, is actually saying that we don't know what, what's going on. So that was very, very interesting. And the cystoscopy and the, uh, and the general anesthetic and hydrodistension point, I think, are very well made as well. Um, one question and one comment. I think uh, I obviously have a very specific uh, interest in the diet, and the, my, uh, one of the lines of treatment is cimetidine. The question is that cimetidine is getting more and more difficult to procure in this country. So uh, that is, is anybody else experiencing the same problem? That's the first thing. And the second thing which um, I use very often is the patient support group. So I have a very large patient population, and these patients have come out of this food box with, with so much difficulty, and, and they've now been treated and so much better. So they take the ownership of talking to the other patients. So I have got a list of patients who are very happy to speak to them. So when I see a patient, I say, would you like to speak to them? And nine out of 10 would say yes. And when they come back second time, they are so much more informed and so much more uh, happy that they are the, not the only ones who are suffering. So I think that we underestimate the importance of patients talking to the patients as a, just as clinicians. So I think just, just to add to your holistic thing, uh, I, would, I would recommend that as well. Yeah, I think you're right. And um, a lot of the patients will come having, are, are really aware of the patient support groups out there. And now with, with the media, the internet, and the um, availability of sort of international talk between patients, I find a lot of my patients are on adjoining support groups and patient groups in the States. Um, the Cobb Foundation is very useful in this country as well. I've not had the problem with cimetidine that you've come across yet. The problem I have with, with advocating cimetidine is I often get back letters from GPs going, why on earth are you prescribing something for uh, gastric reflux? For in London, <laughs> for in London there's uh, very few chemists who have 200 milligrams of cimetidine. It's just literally not there, and we are, we are really struggling with that. And just one thing I like, last thing about the diet, uh, these patients came together initially about 15 years ago, and they actually looked at all the diets, and we formed a, a separate diet sheet for ourselves, so much so that these patients have taken interest now, like they're almost writing cook cookery books on that diet, so that specifically to IC patients like avoiding those things. So they are so very happy to share that with people if they want to. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'd just like to finish with one last live voting um, question, just to see if anybody's opinions changed over the course of this session. So if you could get your app at the ready. Um, in your opinion, who do you think now should have responsibility for the management of the patient of these patients with bladder pain syndrome? Again, general urology, urology with special interest, pain specialist, GP, gynecologist, or specialist MDT. So if you could vote now. Well, I think we've convinced a few people that a specialist MDT is the way forward. Thank you very much to all the speakers for an excellent session for this really difficult topic, and I hope you've all um, found it of value. Thank you. Thank you.